My name is Nancy Lomibau. I am the program director over at the Cancer Support Community in Redondo Beach. And I'm part of the Cancer um, Survivorship Program. We have several, hi, we have several uh, attendees tonight that are part of the consortium. So we have Torrance Memorial Medical Center, Torrance Memorial Physicians Network, Cancer Care, Healthcare Partners, California Hematology Oncology Medical Group, um, Cancer Support Community, American Cancer Society, Beach Cities Health District, Kaiser Permanente, South Bay and Harbor UCLA. And we're all part of the, the South Bay Survivorship Consortium. We began meeting in 2009 with a focus on providing education for survivors. And we've been providing these workshops since 2010. So the first thing that I want to encourage you all to visit is outside these doors. Lily Oncology has a presentation out there, their art exhibit. Uh, it's called Oncology on Canvas. Uh, and they definitely appreciate your uh, visits and continued support. We also have some information tables over here on the right hand side. We have Torrance Memorial has a table, American Cancer Society, as well as Cancer Support Community. So please pick up any of the resources over there. There's a lot of really great uh, classes and information. So today we're going to be meeting and talking about managing chemo brain, the science and art of putting the pieces back together. Uh, we're gonna hear from a chemo brain research scientist, Dr. Sunita Patel. She's gonna be talking about the causes and risk factors for chemo brain. And then we'll be hearing from Charmone LaRose, who will give us some practical tips as well as some strategies to help manage and conquer chemo brain. Um, what's coming up next in August is our next program on August 8th. The presentation will be on integrative oncology. So we hope many of you can make that. You'll be hearing and seeing more information soon regarding that. But we'll be discussing strategies to help boost survivorship and the speakers will be focusing on nutrition, physical health, and mental health. So just wanna talk very quickly about what's at your seat with you. Um, there are handouts related to today's program. There's also uh, information available at the different display tables. You will see there's an evaluation form, and that evaluation form is so valuable for us that put on these workshops because it it allows for you to tell us what you want to hear about. So please take the time to fill out that evaluation form. Uh, we definitely enjoy uh, reading your feedback. And if you want to be on the contact list to be informed about other upcoming workshops, please make sure to include your email at the bottom and try to do it as legibly as possible. <laughs> I know I, my C's look like E's and my, you know, my letters sometimes can blend together. So please just pretend like you're turning it into your fourth grade cursive writing teacher or something. Um, the other thing is we will be taking some questions and answers. Um, however, what we ask is that you write them down on a piece of paper and we'll have a microphone at uh, the end of the presentation, of each presentation, and you'll be able to ask your questions. So make note of them on that piece of paper you were given. And then just a few thank yous. A thank you, of course, to Lily Oncology, um, Christine Souter, who brought all of the Oncology on Canvas information. Our refreshments, our sandwiches, salad, cookies, et cetera, were, were brought um, by well, they were actually donated through Beach City's Health District, but they're from a restaurant called Saks on the Beach. Um, nice little pun. So I'm going to go ahead now and just um, 
let you know about our speakers that will be here today. And I'm going to introduce uh, first Dr. Sunita Patel. She's an associate professor in the Department of Population Sciences at City of Hope Cancer Center. She's a neuropsychologist whose research is focused on cognitive symptoms and other quality of life outcomes in cancer survivors. Her research has been funded by grants from the National Cancer Institute, the American Cancer Society, and the California Breast Cancer Research Program. Currently, she's studying the impact of chronic life stress in cognitive dysfunction and as a risk factor for women with breast cancer. She's the principal investigator of a multi-site study funded by the American Cancer Society that is studying interventions to improve learning outcomes in children treated for leukemia. And as a cl clinician, she hopes to work with both adults, or she does work with both adults and pediatric patients at the City of Hope Center in um, Duarte. So please help me welcome Dr. Sunita Patel. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you all here today. I thank uh, Sophia and Miriam for the invitation. Um, so as you heard, I'm going to focus on sort of uh, uh, letting you know about some um, the findings in the scientific literature about chemo brain. Um, but before I get started, I should I should let you know I'm really impressed by this consortium. I think it's a, it's a really great resource for all of you. We don't have anything like that in Pasadena, which is where I'm at. I mean, you know, we have resources, but this is great where it's a partnership of nine organizations. And, um, and I also commend you for taking advantage. Um, you know, it takes, it takes time and effort to get ready, drive in, and so pat yourself on the back, you know, for taking advantage and uh, sort of wanting to um, educate yourself. And as you'll hear later, that's actually a step towards managing chemo brain, so, you know, taking care of your well-being. So, okay, what I'm going to do is um, give you an overview of research findings, and in that process, I'll talk a little bit about the results from some research that I've done at City of Hope, and um, I will also spend some time talking about uh, clinical considerations, and so when I do that, I'm going to give you some examples of cases that I get as a neuropsychologist. Uh, people are referred to me because they're concerned about chemo brain. So let me clarify that the term chemo brain is actually a colloquial term. It's informal. It's not a, a medical diagnosis. So it's an informal term used by cancer patients to describe um, changes in thinking, memory, and cognition. And it's typically, these changes are typically attributed to the effects of chemotherapy on the central nervous system. And it was first brought to the attention of the medical community by patients, similar to like other quality of life symptoms, uh, like fatigue. And um, as some of you may know, it's of great concern to uh, people who experience it. And here's a description that I pulled from uh, the Leukemia Lymphoma website. So this person wrote, I too still suffer from chemo brain. I'm 18 months in remission and it flares especially when I'm tired. I stutter and have word retrieval problems. I also have short-term memory problems. So I thought that was a, a very good description of the kinds of complaints that um, patients usually have. So with that kind of description from many, many, many survivors, cognitive dysfunction is now recognized as a legitimate side effect. It always, hasn't always been that case. Um, and it's now referred to as cancer-related cognitive impairment, CRCI. So if you're reading you know, in a research article, that's how it's referenced. But it's perfectly fine to call it chemobrain. So, 
What I can tell you is that there has been a lot more research in this area in the past 15 years after patients started speaking up and sort of wondering what, it was, what this was all about. And because of that research, what we know a few things, and I'm gonna to try to summarize that for you. Um, one thing that's important to emphasize is that the severity and the extent of cognitive changes that you um, see is, is very different in people who have, whose disease involves the central nervous system, so like a brain tumor, okay? That's very different from people whose cancer is outside of the central nervous system. Um, and for most of us, I think, you know, that makes sense. Children and adults who have been treated for malignant brain tumors are at a high risk for having these cognitive changes. And that's kind of intuitive, because the cancer's in the brain. Um, but surprisingly, it's not often the brain tumor that causes the cognitive issues. It's a lot of other things. It could be because of the seizures that the, the tumor evokes. Um, Often, it's, it's really the radiation, which is a big cornerstone of uh, treating brain tumors. And it's the radiation to the brain that can end up causing a lot of cognitive problems, especially um, in young children whose brains are still developing. Uh, another group that's at risk for having some cognitive changes because of their cancer and its treatment are leukemia and lymphoma survivors who had uh, interspinal chemotherapy. So this is where the chemotherapy is injected into your central nervous system. Um, a lot of the younger kids uh, with leukemia, that's kind of, that's a treatment they, they have. And, but what's really kind of not very intuitive is that there's actually a subgroup of cancer patients who are vulnerable to having these cognitive changes after chemotherapy, even without this sort of intrathecal administration. So even when it's not directly injected into your central nervous system, there's a subgroup that's still finding that there's cognitive issues afterwards. Um, and these types of studies have been done in patients who have, you know, um, their cancer that's outside of the central nervous system. So this includes um, individuals with breast cancer, uh, colon cancer, testicular, lung, and uh, we just did a really big study showing that uh, patients who have bone marrow transplant, that um, uh, especially when it's uh, allergenic, uh, seem to be at risk also. So when I talk about cognitive changes um, in, in patients who don't have a brain tumor, who don't have you know, disease, uh, cancer outside of the central nervous system, the true incidence is actually really not very clear. I mean, when you look at the research articles, it's, it's all over the place. The estimates are from 15% of these patients complain of you know, chemo brain or cognitive changes to as high as 61%. Uh, and it you know, kind of depends on uh, the, the study design and when they talk to these patients, how they tested them, and, and um, all of that variability. Now the good news is that we are definitely learning after 15 years of research is that while many individuals do experience some changes during treatment, so as you're going through your chemotherapy or some other treatment, there is eventual recovery, right? So most, that's, that's certainly my, been my clinic, clinical experience and even in my research, um, that really um, over time there is gradual recovery of these you know, short-term memory problems and things like that. Now, there is a subgroup, there's a, there's a small minority that seem to have uh, persistent dysfunction, you know, possibly years after the treatment. And I'll, ex I'll talk to you more about that. Um, and, and we've got some good ideas about who this subgroup is, uh, but really they're not they're not really well defined yet, and so, you know, it's an evolving area of research, and it is, it's an area that really does need some more funding put into it. Um, and, and so why would we study this chemotherapy? I mean, shouldn't we put all of our money into curing cancer, some, some would say? And so some of the reasons why it's important to also, you know, uh, put research into areas like this is because the reality is that uh, more and more patients with cancer are living longer. 
We're doing a great job curing the cancer. Um, and the American Cancer Society reported back in 2015 that there's 14.5 million cancer survivors in the United States. And I know this number is even higher now. So one of the reasons we should study this is because we should understand kind of the negative effects of cancer treatment since people are living with it for, for many, many years. Um, it's also important to study this because we should prepare patients for what to expect. You know, it's, it's if, you, if you're prepared for what to expect when there's changes in, in your functioning and your well-being, well it's less scary, especially if somebody tells you that it's going to get better. Um, and then, it, you know, research like this can also help the medical team distinguish what's the expected course of symptoms from excessive toxicity. Because if you, you know, if you're a provider and you have excessive toxicity, you might decide to change the treatment protocol. But if you know that these symptoms are like, well, you know, yeah, they're kind of expected. A lot of people get, you don't change your treatment for the patient. Um, and then I think we do need to understand that if the cognitive dysfunction is persistent for many, many years in a group, what's it associated with? I mean, there's one study that suggests people decide to retire early because of these issues, but is that really the case? And so we need, to, we need the research to figure that out. Um, and then also it's important to uh, do this type of research because maybe we need to start looking for treatments that are equally effective in curing, treating the cancer, but have less interference with you know, our quality of life. And the poster child for this is pediatric oncology. So the, in the past 20, 30 years ago, the researchers finally you know, understood what parents of children with cancer knew all along, that their kids uh, ended up having learning disabilities years after the treatment was done. And so once the research kind of confirmed this, the oncology community kind of started working to change their chemotherapies. And now, nowadays, you know, we don't have radiation to the brain for the little kids, and even the chemotherapies that are being used are not as intense. And of course, you always have to balance. Like, you still want to save lives, and you don't want to have relapse. But at the same time, you don't want to have the kids ending up with, you know, big cognitive issues and not being able to graduate from high school, which is what was happening 30 years ago. So, um, the research design has evolved. The earlier studies some 15 years ago were cross-sectional um, in long-term survivors. So what I mean by that is that the researchers did a snapshot. They only, you know, they would look, they would talk to survivors once, like maybe 10 years after, you know, um, their cancer treatments. Um, and that's just not enough of an idea of how all of this evolves and changes across time. Uh, and back then, they would compare patients who got chemotherapy to, you know, people who never had cancer. Uh, because back then, they thought all of this was only being caused by chemotherapy. So they would have these two groups, and they would compare um, them to one another. And the study was, the research was helpful because, you know, it was identified that the dose of the chemotherapies and the kind of treatment regimen you got uh, influences if you're going to have cognitive changes or not. And we learned that the more intense the chemotherapy, so if you had more, many more cycles of very high dose chemotherapy, the more you'd be at risk for having some cognitive changes. Um, and then we also learned that certain chemotherapies were more neurotoxic than others. And back then, um, this regimen called CMF, uh, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, and 5-FU, uh, was used quite frequently to treat breast cancer. And that turned out to be um, uh, linked with kind of a higher incidence of uh, cognitive issues. And actually, back in 2014, um, they came out with a paper where they followed these survivors for over 20 years. So, so these are women who got that really neurotoxic regimen, and they followed them 20 years later, and they looked at their brains. They did some neuroimaging studies, and they, and they compared them to people who had never had 
um, cancer and the chemotherapy. And they found that actually there were some changes in the gray matter of the brain. So gray matter uh, consists mainly of neurons, which are the information processing units in our brain. And so, you know, that research team speculated that um, the, the, um, the less gray matter that they saw in these survivors was equivalent to four years of aging. Now, the current study designs are prospective and longitudinal. So what that means that instead of just a snapshot, nowadays they're actually wanting to you know, follow patients as soon as they're diagnosed, and then they walk with them all the way through the various treatments, and one year later, two years later, five years later, 10 years later, to find out, well, how is all of this evolving? Does it change? Does everybody you know, get this side effect? And how bad is it? And who gets it? And so all of these things are happening now. Um, and then the other kind of you know, better design if you will, is that instead of only looking at people who got chemotherapy, they're actually also talking to survivors who got other types of treatments. So that could be radiation, or it could be just only surgery for you know um, your cancer. And so now it's the focus is no, is no longer just in chemotherapy. And so because of this new type of research. Um, there have been some neuroimaging studies done where you know, they, they looked at kind of um, the brains uh, before anybody started treatment for cancer and then repeated the scans one month after finishing treatment. And uh, it sort of confirmed that actually there are some changes in the gray matter, even with the current chemotherapy regimens. Um, because one of the things is that you know, I talked about the regimens 20 years ago were very, you know, very neurotoxic, and things have been evolving. Chemotherapies have been evolving, and, and we don't use some of the really hardcore drugs anymore. Um, and but we're finding that even with the different chemotherapies that are used now, on the brain scans, you do see that there is an impact on the gray matter. Um, but the scans are also showing that this gray matter changes improve over time. So your, your brain is going back to you know, what it was like before the treatment started. Um, and then some of this, the new research is showing that the cognitive changes may be associated with other treatments. It's no longer thought of as just you know, the term is still chemo brain, but it's not necessarily just chemotherapy that's causing it. And the first paper that came out um, indicating this was in 2011. And, um, you know, again, it was a paper focused on, and, on women with breast cancer. And, and I have to say, a, a lot of this research in chemo brain is done with women with breast cancer. And, and, and I think that's just because of the numbers. Um, I think, you know, so it's, it's not that it's more important than, than any other type of cancer. It just so happens it's a, it's a very high frequency diagnosis. Uh, and we, ha we just have a lot more survivors. Um, and so in that study, they, they looked at cognitive functioning in breast cancer patients who were treated with chemotherapy and compared them to breast cancer patients who didn't get chemotherapy. And they actually found no difference in cognitive changes. And so that was like, huh, that was the first time you know, people were thinking that maybe it's not just chemotherapy. Um, and then this was actually shown in a neuroimaging study too, that you can see these changes in the gray matter even in cancer patients that don't get chemotherapy. Uh, at least in that study. Now, I'm, I'm just reporting on papers, now, and some of, all of this is still being worked out. And so the question was, well, why on earth would this happen? And so I know I read this paper that was done um, in Japan, and they, they looked at, um, they used a mouse model. So all that means is they, they, their patients were mice, and you know, they gave them chemotherapy or they gave them radiation. And so the mice were radiated in parts of the body 
not the brain. And and then they and and then they you know autopsied to autopsy to them looked at the kind of um, the contents of the the chemicals in the brain and they found that even when the radiation did not go to the brain, they were finding neuroinflammation in the brains. So there's something about radiation that causes inflammation that could have some changes in the brain. Now, of course, this is in mice. I'm sure that the dose of radiation they gave was, you know, 100 times more than what's typically given. Um, and also in the mice, that neuroinflammation did recover. So it's not permanent. Um, so I'm just pointing this out to you to kind of like this evolving evidence that it's not just chemotherapy. It's also been found that actually sometimes patients with cancer uh, have cognitive dysfunction, like com you know, comparing their cognitive performance to people who don't have cancer, even before any treatment at all. So that's been reported now recently. And that's even puzzling. Like, how, why would you do that? Why, why is it there? Um, and um, one of the things that's been found that a lot of this has to do with what other core morbid health conditions you have. And that, you know, uh, in one study, people with diabetes or cardiovascular disease are, are prone to have some cognitive changes. And, and that's true in that literature, too. So if you're a cancer patient and you have diabetes and you have, you know, significant cardio cardiovascular disease, you, you're at higher risk to have some, uh, you know, um, to perform, like to have short-term memory issues. It doesn't mean you're impaired or you're deficit, but it just means maybe you will not do as well as somebody who's not had any health issues at all. And then I actually found this in, in one of my studies where we had 181 breast cancer patients. And I also found that the, pa the cancer patients that had some sort of core morbid health condition, so it was you know pulmonary issues, diabetes, uh, hypertension was a big one in my study, and you compare them to the cancer patients who didn't have any other chronic health issues, there was a difference in how they did on the cognitive measures. So, so it kind of, so now we're beginning to understand that the chemo brain, you know, now, now we're saying it's not even directly related to cancer. You know, it's something else going on. Um, so here are some other risk factors that have been, um, uh, displayed in, in some of these research studies. So, you know, cognitive changes in, in cancer patients, right? So one thing that's highly speculated, and you have a couple of studies that suggest this might be true, is if you're treated for your cancer with endocrine therapy. So, so for women, this is done to reduce estrogen in the body. For men, it's done to reduce the um, testosterone. Uh, for prostate cancer or whatever reasons. And so by the, the, this kind of dramatic change in hormones in your body uh, are associated with some feeling of, um, you know, being foggy in your brain, like you're not thinking, you're not as sharp as you used to be. Um, it turns out that some of these supportive care medications, like when you're going through treatment for your cancer, often you get prescribed medications to control your nausea uh, you might be depressed. Uh, you might have sleep disturbance. I mean, there's a lot of stress, and sometimes if you're hospitalized, you know, nurses are you know, walking in the middle of the night to give you medications, and so your sleep cycle is off base. So you might end up taking Ambien or other, you know, medications. So it turns out all of these medications can actually have a side effect, um, cognitive side effect, where you, you feel that you're not as sharp, that you can't think properly, you feel like you're in a fog. Um, sometimes chemotherapy can bump women into early menopause. And, you know, early menopause is an abrupt shock to the body. And, and, and can, it's harder to deal with the cognitive issues that come about as opposed to natural menopause where every, all the physiology is kind of adapting and it's slower and, you know, eventually um, the cognitive issues, if you've had them, do go away. Um, 
So depression is a risk factor for having you know, cognitive changes in cancer patients. Uh, understandably, you know, uh, many cancer patients can become depressed. And we know that depression is associated with physiological changes in the brain. You can have lower levels of neurotransmitters, and these are important for having nerve cells communicate with, with one another. So it wouldn't be surprising that depressed cancer patients would say that they have trouble with memory and thinking. Um, same thing with sleep disturbance. I mean, there's a lot of research coming out that, you know, chronic, bad, chronic sleep problems is actually um, is a risk factor for a lot of bad things. And, and so certainly that's true for cancer patients. Uh, and fatigue, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, explanatory. If you're tired, um, you're not going to concentrate well. It's going to be more difficult for you to take challenge, do challenging tasks. And you're going to walk away feeling like, oh, huh, just not as sharp as I used to be. And maybe you're attributing it to the cancer experience when it could just be that your, your body's worn out. Um, so I did want to also mention age. I think age has to be thought about when we think about cognitive changes um, after cancer. So unfortunately for, for all of us, this is the slope that uh, happens to us. So you know, you at the, the, the let me see. So this is the age, the so 16-year-olds all the way to people in the 80s. And this is actually the trajectory of scores on processing speed tasks. So, you know, all the 16-year-olds are doing great. And then over time, you come, like, mid-40s, you start, it's, you don't do as well as that 16-year-old over here. And by the time you're 80, you're just not going to do as well on one of these processing speed tasks as you did when you were 16 or when you were 20. That's just normal age-related changes in cognition or cognition or thinking skills. Um, and these two lines are just two different types of processing speed tasks. But this, this um, so it, they're two different types of tests. Uh, so, but they're, they're both tapping into processing speed. But you know what? Um, this could just as well be uh, um, sort of like a concentration task. Like uh, this could be something we gave to assess your ability to pay attention and concentrate. These happen to be tests that assess your ability to process information very quickly. Okay. But this is like normal, this is the normal slope for all of us. I think some, once in a while it's possible that if you go through chemotherapy, and you start, you, you, you start beginning to pay more attention to word retrieval problems or like it's to, you're not remembering names as well. And it could be that it's just because of the normal aging. And then, of course, if you're going through you know, um, stress and you know, you're getting chemotherapy, that might just exacerbate what's already normal. You know. There is a, I mean, I didn't want to be all gloom and doom, you know, I mean, this is for all of us. It's like, there are a couple of things that stay just fine as we age, and just, you know, so you know that vocabulary, your, your knowledge of words, is something that actually gets better the older you get. It peaks when we're in our midlife, and it doesn't really change that much as we get older. Now, sure, it might take you a little bit longer to talk about the definition, but it's still there. And as you talk in your everyday life, when you go about communicating with people, your language is still there. It, that's not going downhill like every, you know, not everything else, but a, a lot of other things. <laughs> Hopefully not everything else. So, so I want to bring age into this because I alluded earlier that if you give chemotherapy or radiation to the brain for developing brains, when, when a child is seven, they get diagnosed with cancer and they get these treatments, it does impact the developmental trajectory. Okay? They are at risk for having some subtle learning problems. Um, you know, and that's just because the brain's still developing. It hasn't completely formed. On the reverse end, somebody who's in their 80s gets hardcore drugs thrown at them, they, they're less likely to bounce back physiologically. They're less resilient at that point. 
And so the impact to your cognitive functioning is more than if you are 50 or 60 when you got the same medications. Um, so I think aging factors into all of this. And then I also want to kind of talk to you about cognitive reserve. Um, so cognitive reserve is the idea that, you know, some people are more vulnerable for cognitive changes because they've already had a lot of insults that happen in their life. If you've had two or three head injuries, you know, in your earlier life, now you've kind of used up, you could think of it as you've used up some of your reserve. Uh, and so maybe you're less resilient. You bounce back, you know, less quickly from chemotherapy. Um, and, and it turns out that people, people that are in, in, have been doing jobs that really involve a lot of cognitive thinking and, you know, just you're using your brain, whatever that job is, and you've been doing it for years, and you've kind of, you know, uh, your, your uh, dendritic networks and everything has been supported because of your cognitive activity and other things like exercise, which you're gonna hear about later. You know, those people actually are more resistant. Those people may bounce back way quicker from the chemo brain that they experience going through chemotherapy. So there is that factor th to think about. Um, you know, in aging, the blood-brain barrier is more permeable. The, the, the juncture is, is less tight, and so you have a higher quantity of drug that's crossing into your brain. And that can be true for people who have had a lot of head injuries or who have had stroke in the past. Their bl uh, blood-brain barrier is not as tight. Uh, and so they have a different experience. So here would be kind of the, um, you know, a slope in, in healthy people. Like you go along and then, you know, now you're aging. And so you have that downward curve that I showed you before. Um, but if you're, you know, if you have less cognitive reserve, you still have that downward curve, but maybe it's a little, it starts, it's more steep. And so over time, it could be, you know, there's a little bit more of a change, like an 80-year-old with less cognitive reserve might look differently from an 80-year-old who has more. So these, these are actually ideas. I don't know, I don't think there's enough research that's definitively shown this, but I think the, there's really consensus that this seems to make a lot of sense. And it also it helps explain the variability, because not everybody talks about chemo brain. Not everybody has you know, changes as they go through treatment. Um, and some of it might have to do with the drug that you got, the, the treatment, and some of it might have to do with these types of things. And this is where you know, we also have to talk about genetic predisposition. Some people are just vulnerable to cognitive changes because of the germline mutations that they were born with, and that's just how it is. Lifestyle factors may influence this, um, possibly. Uh, that's something that's still being researched. So how do we measure cognitive changes or cognitive dysfunction? Um, one way is sort of subjective, and that's like you just, you know, you interview somebody. I would, I would sit down with you and talk to you about, well, you know, whatever you noticed, and when does it happen, and what, what triggers it, and does it change throughout the day, and what makes it better, does anything make it better? Um, and then, or sometimes there isn't a face-to-face -face interview. It might be a questionnaire. It's like a survey that you fill out. Um, and then the gold standard is actually objective testing. So it, it could be a cognitive screen. So this is like a 10, 15 minute, you know, screen that your physician may even do ask you, you know, to count uh, by sevens, uh, spell world backwards. They'll ask you to remember these three objects and then five minutes later. Um, but the gold standard is neuropsychological assessment. And this is, you know, anywhere from two to five hours of somebody sitting down with you. It's a trained examiner and giving you lots of different tests to tap into lots of different cognitive skills. So language, visual spatial thinking, processing speed, attention, executive functioning, working memory, all of those things. Um, you might get sent, uh, if, you, if you complain about chemo brain, you actually might get referred for a brain MRI. Now what the MRI will do is it'll rule out that you have a brain tumor or that there's something else structurally with your brain. But 
it cannot show that you have cognitive dysfunction. It's only looking at structure. Uh, you need a neuropsychological assessment to figure out if your cognitive functioning is way below where you should be for your age compared to people across the country who don't have health issues. Uh, one of the things that I do is I talk to um, uh, you know, the spouse, people like husbands, wives, or anybody else that is in that uh, person's life to figure out if they've no noticed anything. And I think it's important for me to point out, and the research shows this, that a lot of patients who report that they have cognitive changes after cancer, that doesn't always match up on the neuropsychological assessment um, testing. And, and I'll give you a couple of cases to, uh, to highlight that. And I, I need to watch time, too. Um, so here's the first case. This was, these are cases that were referred to me as a neuropsychologist. So I uh, had a, so met with a 49-year-old woman. She was, uh, began treatment for metastatic breast cancer two years before she saw me. The, her disease was under control, and she was ready to go back to work. And she needed to go back to work. Uh, she had a master's in nursing, and she previously worked as a really high-functioning job as a NICU director. Now she was reporting cognitive problems, mostly short to memory. She said she misplaced objects. She had difficulty remembering names. Um, said she would not be able to go grocery shopping if she didn't have a list with her. Um, and she says she triple checks her work when she's balancing her checkbook. Uh, and then there are several minutes throughout the day when she feels like she's in a fog. So the neurologist referred her uh, to me for neuropsychological um, assessment. Uh, and I you know, got a little bit of her cancer treatment history. And she did have six cycles of a uh, couple of uh, chemotherapies, and then she had another nine cycles by the time she came to City of Hope. She'd also had two spinal surgeries, had meningitis, secondary to leakage because of um, what, after one of the surgeries. And, and the cancer had been detected in the liver also. And um, these nodding out uh, episodes that she described um, were, could possibly be seizures, and, and she was getting worked up for that. She was fatigued, but she was not depressed. Uh, so before I, I show you her cognitive scores, I, I want to just point out that a lot of human traits, qualities, tend to be normally distributed. They're distributed on the, nor the bell curve. And most of us, you know, height-wise uh, or whatever, tend to place in this, this range. Most of us, height-wise, weight-wise, will be here. People that um, are on this end might be exceptionally tall, or people are on this end are, might be, you know, really um, uh, uh, short. Uh, but the majority, 68% of the population, is going to be in this area. And even more dramatically, 95% uh, of us are going to be in this area. So that's two standard deviations plus or minus the mean. So the mean is going to be smack in the middle, and most of us are just going to be all the way around here. If you're in this range, it means you're really, really bright, like genius level. And if you're here, you've got some Tr like s s very major s cognitive issues. So this is the cognitive uh, scores for the case that I um, presented to you. So you know, it you can see that language. Uh, her scores on the bunch of language tests that we gave her are smack where she should be. She's in that range that we all place in. But then you start seeing her motor skills are like in this severely impaired range. You see that her scores in visual spatial tests range from, you know, severe, like in the really, really low to even coming into the average range. And so the scores were all over the place. Um, and, and so this would be a situation where her, her report, her subjective experience of being very different were consistent with the neurocognitive scores. Uh, and her deficit scores are all the more striking, striking because she was very high functioning before the cancer. Um, but this type of severity cannot be attributed to chemotherapy only. This particular person, I mean, had a lot of complications of the disease and its treatment. Um, 
she might have had some met metastases to her central nervous system that hadn't been detected. I mean, she possibly could have had seizures too. So here's a second case. So we, have a four, we had a 45-year-old woman uh, who was diagnosed with breast cancer four years before she uh, was referred to me. She had a lumpectomy, got four cycles of chemotherapy. She was started on tamoxifen, so that endocrine therapy. Um, and she was, you know, repeatedly telling her oncologist that she had chemo brain. Um, she was a high school graduate with some college, and she was working part-time when I saw her. She said the cognitive changes had improved since her um, cancer, but it was still a problem. She, she would say, she said, I used to be smart. I'm the lamest one in the quilting group. She said she was never, she was never strong in math, but now she couldn't keep up with her 10-year-old daughter. And with, with the interview, she was, you know, she had fatigued and she was sad, but she wasn't depressed and she was grateful to be alive. And when I asked her if anybody else had noticed her brain freeze, as she called it, she said she always pointed it out herself. Nobody else kind of was collaborating that things had changed or were a problem for her. And, and she said if she didn't have chemo brain, she would go back and finish her college degree, which was a dream for her. So here's her scores. We did the same neurocognitive testing. And all of her scores you see are smack in that range that we would expect for most of us, and even some more even in the average. So here you have a situation where you know, we have two ch women with different treatment protocols, with both with primary concern of cognitive dysfunction, but only one abnormal finding but it was equally real to both of them. I mean, they were making uh, life decisions based on this. And so, you know, it takes some work to figure out what's going on. Um, I think it's important to consider the context of the individual's life, um, because the reality is that cognitive changes in people who don't have cancer in the central nervous system are, are really mild. They're relatively mild, but, uh, for somebody who's in a high profile job, uh, even that slight change from how they used to be before could be a big impact uh, and could interfere with how well they do at their job. Um, and, and somebody who you know, is retired and can take plenty of time to balance their uh, you know, checkbook, that's not a problem. It's not impacting their daily life. Uh, so I think this, these are the kinds of things that you have to um, just think about. I also want to mention that sometimes um, this discrepancy between, between uh, a patient reporting cognitive problems and we do the testing and we don't see it could be because of compensation. So here is sort of uh, a case that will um, highlight that. So this report came out in 2007. In the top panel, um, you have a twin, um, it's a breast cancer patient. Um, and, and below is her twin who didn't have cancer. And so both of these women were seen for neurocognitive testing, and they both did just fine. No problems, the, the breast cancer patient did not have any problems on the cognitive testing. But when we asked, um, well, it, was, it wasn't me that did the study, but when they asked, um, you know, the, uh, the, the two women to do a small test in the scanner, what they found is that the, the cancer patient had more areas of the brain that were lighting up, that were more activated when she was doing the same task compared to her sister. So this is showing that they're doing the same task, that do equally well, but the cancer patient is having to recruit more areas of the brain to do the same task. It's more effort. So, that's just something to you know, consider. It might be more exhausting, I think, to do the same task. So the neuroimaging studies show us you know, what parts of the brain might be involved with these different tasks, but they don't really tell us about what's causing the cognitive changes. And so one of the things that's really been speculated is that um, is immune dysfunction is a problem. Um, I'm gonna try to skip a few things just in the interest of, I don't want to go over my allocated time. So what is immune deregulation? And so this, is, this happens to all of us. So there's an immune response that's activated in us. 
when um, the immune cells in our body, they detect a pathogen invasion. So like if you have the, the flu virus, you know, that's an assault to the body. Or if you have this t uh, tissue injury, so the immune system, the immune response is activated. And, and when it's activated, there's these things called pro-inflammatory cytokines, this type of protein in the body. And, and they trigger this response where the brain says, oh, okay, I've got I've to have some changes. So, you know, people um, stop moving around a lot, um, they sleep more, they don't eat as much, and they're basically conserving their resources to recover from this immune challenge. And in an acute inflammatory response, like with the flu, these cytokine levels eventually go back to normal. But if, you, if your immune challenge is chronic, if you have this, uh, if whatever's happening to you is just always there, uh, the feedback loop becomes deregulated. So, so the production of these cytokines doesn't get shut off. And so you just have these perpetually high levels of cytokines. And the thinking is that when you have cancer, this is what's happening, that the immune system, the immune response has kicked in and you have this perpetually high levels of cytokines that's impacting how your brain is functioning. So you're more prone to fatigue, you're more prone to memory problems, and that's a theory uh, for why chemo brain can happen. And then of course the treatments for the cancer also is an, you know, triggers the immune response because that's tissue injury. And so that immune response is kicked back in and so now you have more cytokines that are floating around. Um, and when you have these high levels of cytokines in your body, they actually do cross into the brain um, and impacts your functioning. Okay, so I have five minutes left. I was going to talk to you about a research study that I did at City of Hope. I think I'm going to skip to the punchline, which is that in that study, we actually did find that um, treatment for cancer changes your levels of cytokines. So, um, so whether, so here's, this is the, the we, we tested, um, we looked at, we took some blood and we looked at the levels of certain types of cytokines in healthy women. So this is the first time we tested them and this is like a few months later. And you see there's not much change in the levels of cytokines, these pro-inflammatory pro cytokines. But for the women who got surgery, the levels changed over time, they increased radiation, they increased uh, chemotherapy didn't increase as much as I expected, and it may be just the kind of protein we looked at. Women who got chemotherapy and radiation had the highest change. Um, so I, I think there's some, definitely something to this, that, that there is an immune uh, regulation aspect to um, symptoms that are associated with cancer and its treatment. Um, and let me see, the punchline I think from the study, the good news is that when we looked at our uh, participants two years later, so we looked at them before any treatment at all for cancer, and we followed them over time. Two years after they finished treatment, there's definitely, these cytokine levels are going back to baseline. Uh, the memory is going back to baseline. The cytokine levels hadn't gone completely back to baseline, but I suspect that if I had enough funding and I was looking at these people five years later, it probably would be even closer. So it's, I think it's, it's, it's a message that I think it's important for you to know is that there is recovery happening over time. So what are the treatment implications of like a possible immune deregulation role in these symptoms? And um, you know, should we do interventions to reduce chronic inflammation? Uh, would that facilitate recovery? And, and this is something that people are talking about. So lifestyle activities like exercise, nutrition, you know, adequate sleep, and you're gonna hear a little bit about this, that that could have a role in, in beefing up your immune system and helping it regulate itself. In terms of medications to you know, reduce this type of uh, inflammation, that's not certain at this point. And I think I'm gonna stop there um, and leave enough, so that way we have enough time for questions later on. Um, I wanted to show you this slide. 
there's a lot more research being done uh, looking at ways to help the recovery and to address you know, the group that does have persistent cognitive issues. And so these are all the studies that have been done in the past five years. Okay? All right. Thank you again, Dr. Patel. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna talk a little bit now about the second part of our program, uh, which is strategies and tools to conquer chemo brain. And today we have a wonderful speaker, Charmone LaRose. She's uh, been in the field of aging since the 1980s. As a gerontologist and memory impairment specialist, she's directed programs for the aging population in adult daycare, assisted living, skilled nursing, and at senior centers. In, the in 1990, she began teaching in the older adult program at Torrance Adult School and became the department chair and resource teacher in 1991. For 25 years in this position, she expanded the program in the South Bay community, and part of that expansion was the collaboration with Torrance Memorial's Advantage program in providing health education classes that began in 1997. Since her retirement in 2016 with Torrance Unified School District, she continues as a health educator teaching classes in caregiving, brain games, and yoga here at Torrance Memorial Medical Center and in the community. She's part of the Speakers Bureau, a volunteer for Miracle of Living lecture series, and recently helped found a nonprofit organization called Optimal Life Educational Foundation that will provide even more educational opportunities for the 55 plus crowd here in the South Bay. So please help me welcome Charmone LaRose. And I first would like to say I'm very happy to be here, and uh, actually I'm very honored to be here in such company of people who have had such strength and perseverance in very difficult situations. I know some of you out there. And I haven't experienced chemotherapy uh, myself, but of course I have family and friends who have. And I first heard about the chemo brain by students who came to my memory classes and <clears throat> some time ago. And I guess my question is, is this in alignment, your, the handout, and starting with exercise? Okay, we're good, so let's go. Um, so first of all, we are going to address physical fitness. Certainly when you're starting out with the chemotherapy, you're not going to feel much like moving. But as soon as you can in your medical, staff, uh, people who are advising you say you can please begin to do that because that starts the circulation going, the lymphatic flow, and all of those good things that are important um, for all of us. And this is really partly above all of us who are aging and moving through time that we do need to move. And that's one of the, uh, the researchers have all agreed that we need this. So, you know, what's good for the heart is good for the brain, keeping us active physically because we're getting the blood flow to the brain. We're also getting endorphins in there that help us feel good, and we all want that. So, eventually, this is a recommendation that they make and walk, swim, or do some type of aerobic exercise three to five times a week for 30 minutes. Now, that looks like a big, stiff, you know, that's a a lot to do, but that isn't something you would do right away. Gradually move into your movement and uh, begin slowly and you can break it up. You, I have had friends who do like 10 minutes a day, they're doing jumping, you know, jumping and jacks and movement. So in increments, we can get healthy and um, get a partner, somebody to go with and somebody whose company you enjoy, you certainly can start walking and get further when you're talking with someone. So maybe someone who's from this group. Um, and range of motion exercises are really important. So if you're just walking, there's going to be some movement you're not getting. So that you can get in a class and, or you can find some of that information online, but range of motion to really warm yourself up and get moving. 
And over here on the table where you have gotten flyers over there, we have a number of classes through the Advantage program. Everything from the beginning, chair yoga and movements, all the way to a more vigorous exercise with weights and that sort of thing. So we're one of the many places you could get that. Um, also, we also address that you would want to at some point be able to do some kind of strength training. Once again, advice of the physician because you need that muscle to move. And we begin to lose our muscle mass as we are moving through time. And that's quite a bit after age 51% a year. And due to inactivity, primarily for the general population, due to chronic illness, you would be in that group perhaps. Uh, I mean, that. When we're not moving, we're not making muscle, and it affects our bones and our all of that. But it's reversible. So as we begin to make progress, feeling better, begin to do things, you can start strengthening. You know, once again, advice of the doctor. It doesn't have to be, you know, go to the gym and lift really heavy weights like I tried this week. But, I, you know, you go to a personal trainer, they'll get you really moving. But there's a lot of other things that you can do with uh, stretch bands and... Um, just some of the general exercises. So get that going, and uh, we can regain that muscle by training, even into our 90s. And I don't say that lightly, because as a instructor and at the Torrance Adult School, we had people who basically age in place from the time they're in their 40s all the way up to people in their 90s that are still doing those exercise classes. And they're fit, and they're good, and just like she talked about the cognitive reserve and the resilience we build up these are some things that we can do for ourselves um, so see what the uh, movement options are certainly for agility and for um, stretching we can do tai chi and there's yogas that are there and uh, when you're doing the yoga and tai chi i'll talk about it a little bit later too so we're also working with our minds and getting a balance within our minds and bodies. So anything can really be adapted. And, and there are a number of things out there. And I've, I've talked a little bit about our classes, which I'll mention again at some point. But we, there's also other places here in the South Bay, the YMCA and uh, the adult schools. And if you're in silver sneakers, there's something that you can begin with. OK, choose something. Something that you like, because if you like it, you will do it, right? They look like they're having fun up there. So then what is the uh, connection between the physical fitness and cognitive function? Work your body to save your brain. And that's, um, that's what the research says. Nothing really protects the brain quite like exercise. And these are some of the research, is, uh, some of the research that has been going on. Um, in this research, they found the risk of Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline was reduced by about 35 to 45% with regular exercise. And uh, we talked about the endorphins. And exercise enhances the release of chemicals known as nerve growth factors that help brain cells function properly. So that's a, a new good thing as well. So we're going to shift a little bit then from the things that are physically stimulating our body to mentally stimulating activities, which is important. The brain really needs uh, new and challenging activities to thrive. So when you're not feeling well, you're not probably going to go out and try a lot of new things. But you want to try a little bit as you're recovering. Something that you really enjoy, and even people when they're able to travel and they go to new places, that's very stimulating for the brain. Trying out something that you love. So this starts to um, set up new neural activity. There's neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to develop new neural connections, and this is well known today. It wasn't so well known when I first started teaching these classes about 20 years ago, but there's lots going on out there in the research on brain health and what's good for the brain. And, uh, and we've had a number of speakers here as well, which I will talk a little bit about later. So it's a new area of research. So we want to try new things for ourselves. And they talked a little bit about some of the normal aging 
uh, decline with aging and one of them is that tip of the tongue thing where you can't find the right word and it's so frustrating well the good news is you'll remember it later tonight <laughs> when you can, when you don't need it but some of the things that we do in our classes in the brain games is when you're with a group then you start cueing each other and giving different clues so we, get into remembering some things because it's in there so I always tell my students that you need to do some type of word games keep it up whether it's crossword puzzles or find the word or any of those things that you enjoy keep doing it if there and if you're recovering and you have been haven't been well sometimes it's very soothing just to take on something like that to find the word if you like it and then gradually um, challenge yourself to other things. There's a lot of good books out there with different quizzes and puzzles and you name it. There's going to be a challenge there for every one of us. Some of the people like to work with a Sudoku and uh, different things in the newspaper. So keep that up and, and keep moving forward with it. Um, and there's other types of games that are strategy and visual games also. All of these things make a difference. So I've got a picture of some games there. Explore the new ones, try out a new game. And these are some old games. You might recognize some of those. It's been a while maybe before you played Sorry, but Wheel of Fortune and some of the, we were talking about the different TV shows that have different games of Jeopardy and uh, who wants to be a millionaire if you follow that and you're following along with it. Yeah, that's a good exercise. And does anybody out there watch Cash Cab? Anyone? Okay, well, that's another one. It's on the cable vision. So you, you, you can work it with some other people and quiz yourself. It's all a good thing. And those are some more games there. And, you know, chess or something you may have played before. You know, we used to play a lot of games together. I don't know about you, but where I grew up in northern Michigan, there wasn't much to do in the winter time, so we were playing a lot of card games, and and in in with that was a lot of social interaction. So maybe we can return to some of that. So we have small groups, and I suppose there's a number of people out there that you're doing these games online, right, on your phones or on your computer, and that can be fun and a way to connect with other family members and some of the younger members who enjoy that as well. Now. For people who, if you want to stimulate your long-term memory, which really stays with us forever, um, writing your memoirs or your life story, that's a big thing. I know they have a class over at Torrance Memorial. Or even if you wanted to get in a group and write just a little bit. And certainly when you're going through this process and this journey that you're in with the, in cancer survivorship, that journaling is important. You know, just to get a a place for our thoughts and how we're feeling and you may go back after the uh, years or two and see what that was and just that processing of things helps us to stay in touch with our own feelings so there's a little bit with the memoirs and there's also in writing your life story but also with this journey within yourself so the writing is good um, and actually reading or writing poetry I don't know if there's any poets out there Ah, I see one hand come up. Okay, well, poetry is really good for your mind and memory. Whether it does not, not necessarily memorizing it, but just that working of the words. And there are some groups out there. I know there's a poetry group over at Redondo Beach Library that meets. And so this is a, a way to express ourselves and also use the words and, you know, help ourselves along with it. I put joining a singing class or learning to play an instrument. That's a learning curve if you haven't ever done that, right? Especially with an instrument. How many of you do uh, play an instrument? Anyone out there? I just love one hand. Okay, well, it's something you might try. And over at the y, uh, Salvation Army here in Torrance, there's a new music school there, and there's a gentleman there who's teaching people how to play the piano and do other things and uh, there's some jazz concerts on Thursday night so you're trying to get people started and and who cares what your age is with it if you're enjoying it and you're trying it out or you're revisiting it from the t another time you know do something you love because that's going to get you get you in it you know it's going to get your spirit in there 
It's all being creative, right? And that beautiful art show that's out in the lobby here today was just wonderful to see people creating in their difficult journey and tra a transformative uh, experience in the art. So we always can be benefiting from that, even if it's a little bit at a time. So I'm putting creative activities down here too because we, when we think about stimulating ourselves cognitively, we don't usually think about the creative part, but that's important too. It's like the whole right side of the brain gets ignored. Or did I say right? Yes, the right side, because when you're left-handed, it's the right side that's working. So we're in a society where everything is very uh, linear, you have to be here on time, you have to do this, you have to do that. And we try to stay on top of it all, and we do pretty good with that. And with the uh, chemo brain, those are the kinds of things that come up. And I know she talked, uh, Dr. Patel talked a lot about things showing up before people went back to work. And it's, there's so much going on at everybody's jobs today, and so many things you have to keep track of that that's a heavy load on our brain in general, and in the left side in particular. So doing creative activities engages that other part of ourselves, that other part of our brain, and that can be like a... Oh, okay, I'm finally just listening to music, or I'm painting, or something that's that you enjoy or have always enjoyed. Uh, those of you who like to cook, you know, there's creation with that. And even if you're doing a little bit of the time, choose something that you love and do it so that it's it's nourishing yourself and it's nourishing that part of the brain. So uh, whatever it is you love to do. So. I know usually in the class I'll ask everybody what they like to do and and then, you know, get back in there if there's something that you wanted to do and you haven't been able to do because of your journey with the um, cancer and the chemo brain. Now socialization, that's a big area that's being researched in terms of cognitive health. And it's almost like it seems kind of like an obvious. We're all social beings and we enjoy being together. But certainly when you have an illness come up, you can end up being isolated. And you, and you do need some downtime there for yourself to recover. But it's so important to have a, a circle of friends and people whom you trust and then begin to build on that and go out a little bit more. Um, the research is showing that that is really helping us with longevity and aging well. And um, you learn about new people, and that's a good time to uh, challenge yourself to learn some new names. And so social interactions can lower stress, you know, being who we are. And that's a whole area that um, to look at in terms of if you're starting to build your immune system up again to not be stressed, then this is an area. So stronger social connections lead to better physical health and a stronger immune system, especially in older adults. These are the studies. Um, and they also can translate into an increased feeling of well-being and less depression, which I know Dr. Patel had talked about. It's also growing evidence that Having strong social connections helps maintain cognitive skills and decreases the likelihood of developing dementia. That's a big thing, you know, but it almost seems like an, an obvious in some ways, you know, to us. Um, I don't have this in the slides, but I know there are places called the blue zones, which are places in, across the globe where people, they're studying groups of people that tend to live longer, have greater longevity and fewer health problems, you know, leading better lives, a quality of life. And one of the big components of that is they have a strong sense of community and they're really interactive with each other. Um, you could probably look up blue zones, but actually one that's local here is in Loma Linda. It has to do with how they're eating as well. So we, we're looking at that to say, well, okay, well, what can we do a little better for ourselves? meaningful activities and that's really those people who volunteer show a lot of satisfaction and fulfillment you know and you're not going to do that until you're ready to do that but um, when you're recovering but that helps us to kind of go outside of ourselves and and give to other people and people find that very satisfying and it helps you know kind of build not only your confidence in yourself but also helps to um, once again, lower that sense of stress and, 
and uh, hopefully build the immune system. So find something you enjoy doing and even a meaningful work where sometimes you don't have the luxury of going to work and enjoying your work so much, but you know, you have to make a living at it. But um, maybe find something you do enjoy about your work. Maybe it's the people you work with. Um, and so that's important too, just finding work that you enjoy. And for many people, after they retire, they are able to go and find some things they like to do, and there's a lot more life satisfaction. I might be speaking from my own experience. <laughs> As I, have, I mean, I enjoyed my uh, my work, but once you're out and you're not doing that 40-hour, you know, got to get up every morning, and you're doing something you like and enjoy, you can put your whole self into it. And so I think that helps us all in our stress levels. And laugh, I find your funny friends and keep smiling. Well, you need to be able to laugh when you're going through a journey like you've come through. And I know some of the, uh, not here at this hospital, but I know of one hospital in Long Beach where they used to have a place where people could go a, a room to watch funny movies before they had surgery, just, just to laugh and get the endorphins and the stress down. And hey, if it works, that's great. You know, so keep some things and those friends that are funny, they're just so invaluable, aren't they? they? Know how to say the right things. So social activities, that's important. Now we'll talk a little bit about stress. We know we talked, to, you know, mentioned it before. Stress is um, for all age groups right now. Are they're reporting increased perception of stress? So a lot of that may be due to the impact of our digital age. You always have to be on. It used to be when you went home from your work, you you were you were gone from your work. You didn't have to call in, or somebody wasn't going to call you, email you, text you, and at 12 midnight you get this beep beep in your room. So some of that's going on for all of us. We have to learn to dial that down, right? So, and this is all together for all of us. It's, and it's been kind of overwhelming because you have to kind of find out what's going to work for you and how much you're working with the electronics and how much that's impacting your own life. You know, you want to take the things that are going to help you and leave behind the extra things that you don't need. So everyone's kind of reporting that there's too much to do and too little time, and the time's going by so fast, right? We're already at Memorial Day, ah, because I think we all feel like we're speeded up. So I think we just have to really give ourselves a break. It's okay to slow it down. And certainly an illness can make you slow down whether you wanted to or not. And then when you're coming back into it, come in a little bit at a time. Be selective about what activities you want to do for yourself. You know, be around the people that are helpful and supportive so that all of that will help in this recovery and in building our immune systems and lowering our stress. And gosh knows we're right in the middle of the megapolis here where everything's fast paced and overcrowded in the South Bay. So we have to constantly work with that especially the traffic and um, anyway, and noise levels too. It's hard to find an environment that you can be really quiet in, but if you can get that for yourself in your home or a little space in your garden or find a place where you can feel some serenity, this is really good and helps supporting yourself from the inside out. Um, and if you have a Ill chronic illness, or an illness, or in this case, they've gone through chemotherapy, um, it may decrease our ability to adapt or cope to all the noises and the outside extraneous. So being um, gentle with yourself and, and realize that this is a factor that, that we're all, that you're working with, and it's important to be able to just take it a little bit at a time, or maybe ask people, you know, explain to people, hey, I need a little more downtime here. Um, and I've got in here caregiving situations place a drain on our physical and emotional reserve. So that's a one-liner for all of our caregiver classes because certainly people in this room, I know many of you have mentioned, you're caring for someone who has an illness. And actually most of us at some point in our life will have to do that and it can really drain that person. So caregivers need extra attention or extra time for themselves and extra support. That's really a big factor. And for them surviving, it, it, even caring for someone with a difficult um, illness. 
Uh, we do have a caregiver support class here at Torrance Memorial. We have uh, care, two caregiver classes. I, I teach the caregiver classes and caring for someone with dementia, that's another one. There's um, other classes in the community too as other, uh, you know, Beach Cities is, is responding to needs for caregivers all around. So if you are a caregiver, please tap into the resources that are available because that's, that's a heavy load too. And I know there's a lot of caregivers in here in this room tonight. Once again, the stress does impact our physical and mental health. Um, so what we have going on there when there's a threat, uh, we perceive the pituitary gland signals the adrenal glands to produce cortisol in the bloodstream. And that can affect the hippocampus of the brain important in episodic memory and it may kill brain cells especially over a prolonged period of time so you've got a situation with the, with the cancer and the illness that's a chronic situation that you've got a lot of stress going over a period of time so and i know you've mentioned it about that that being part of the chemo brain and i know that what i was looking at was saying well which is the chemo therapy which is the stress and which is the illness itself so all of that's within there so you want to have an understanding that that is going on and it can of course uh, depress the immune system and your research sounds uh, very interesting what you're working with with that um, and prolonged chronic stress causes premature aging of the brain they've seen that so we want to get on top of it as well as we can I know there's a lot of balls in the air in terms of trying to get well get rid of the chemo brain reduce your stress and all of that that's a lot right so that's going to take some time and patience for all of us that are involved your family that's involved with you as well so I'm we always say give yourself time out during the day and um, do whatever it is that relaxes you because what relaxes me may not relax you uh, you know a nature walk or music or maybe being with your pets uh, maybe being with children you know maybe that relaxes you maybe it puts you in a goes the other way so find the things that help you relax and I've got down here meditate learn what has helped people for thousands of years in religious and secular circles so whether whatever your spiritual uh, beliefs are find out what within that will help you whether it's meditation or prayer or something that's quiet that will help quiet us down there's a lot of research going on on meditation right now out through Harvard uh, University but also over here in UCLA they're looking at yoga and meditation what's going on in the brain when we can quiet ourselves down and um, the meditation can decrease stress and research shows it increases gray matter in the brain so lots going on with that they've got <laughs> i have amazing home has all the monks hooked up with their little electrodes and seeing what's going on with the meditation so oh, so we can have it can have some widespread effects now meditation is simple but it's not always easy to just sit there and be quiet when you have a thousand things racing in your head so you can learn how to meditate. There is a class actually that's going on right now tonight. Uh, Vicki Hirschberger teaches it, but I've got a flyer over there. There's meditation where you can learn how to do that. Um, here at the hospital or um, Beach Cities Health District had something on meditation, the mindful meditation. I know there's even apps on your phone. So, and different spiritual groups I know in the South Bay there's Ananda so you can find different ways to learn you know just be patient with yourself and um, I don't think I have an exact research to, up there today but you know, 10 minutes a day twice a day sitting quiet and even if you're not um, doing something that's a technique you know sitting quiet that can make a difference so when you're, you're moving inward chill with friends you may have a friend who looks like this <laughs> pets can help so much and they seem to be in tune with you right i know our cat comes and, when you're not feeling well he wants lays right on you so he can be petted but they they, they gravitate toward us in our illness and they really can help us in our recovery 
Um, so one of those little critters or finding your quiet time in nature, something to still yourself. So then I have a little bit here about yoga and brain health. And um, okay, so uh, that uh, the practice of yoga has been a part of the discipline of millions of people throughout the world for many centuries. So it's very ancient, but boy, there's a lot of yoga going on here today. And there can be something for everyone who wants to try it. And um, we do have chair yoga here or beginning yoga classes, if that's something you want to try. I always say I teach non-pretzel yoga and uh, something <laughs> so you get a lot of stretching and you're working both sides of the body and it also helps us to we always do relaxation in a yoga class so find something that works for you and the uh, research have shown that the benefits of the body mind and emotions and recent research indicates it's good for brain health so you know, like i said they're doing that research up at ucla for in our backyard here it helps grow parts of the brain, including gray matter and new synaptic connections are added in some neurogenesis. So you can look at that research. Um, and then here's one where they compared uh, MRI scans of yoga practitioners, showed larger brain volume in practitioners in several important areas of the brain, including the hippocampus, critical to creating new memories. And then another study showed yoga improvement, the brain speed and accuracy on cognitive tests after a session. So those are some things that are going on in that area. And um, I know one of the problems with the chemo brain is hard to focus. And so that's where taking one thing at a time and, and learning how to focus in this, either a yoga class or maybe meditation or just being, doing what focusing on one thing at a time and that's you're not the only ones that are having this problem i think just about everybody's having the problem with the focus you know just when you're going through a checkout line and trying to get through it there's just so many distractions so anything we can do to help us focus will be important sleep and you know the for all the research on sleep they're still saying seven to eight hours are important for us um, less sleep and drowsiness increases the risk of falls and car accidents. You know, they're saying that driving while sleepy is equal to driving while drunk. And they're really looking at some of that. So the brain really needs to sleep to detox uh, physically and also to restore the neurochemicals. And we need our dream time. You know, our REM sleep is very important for help us, you know, we sort out things mentally and emotionally. So when I know whether you're in a treatment or on medication that, that may, you're not being able to sleep, that's really something to look at in terms of the chemo brain too. So, um, you know, sorting that all out. I've just put a couple of things here, avoid active exercise and eating close to bedtime and check with your physician for supplements, foods, and as a very final recourse medication for um, going to sleep because there's always some side effects. And I'm not saying too much about the environment, but setting up a good environment, there's a lot of tips that we do have a class called Sounder Sleep, which I understand will begin again in September. So there are you know, kind of some practical ways how to get a better night's sleep. So that's part of it. And that looks like a happy baby. <laughs> we all want to sleep like that. All right, so nutrition. Nutrition is a big area for all of us and for, for brain health. And, you know, they're looking at the research with, and a lot of the um, studies going into um, cognitive decline and work looking at dementia, preventing that, have to do with dietary and nutrition, diet and nutrition. So there's lots of research going on in that area. And, of course, it also it would be good for all of us. Um, uh, Nutrient-rich foods can help control vascular risks and protect cognitive function. So there's a list that you probably have seen elsewhere, somewhere, those colorful fruits and vegetables and their juices, whole grain and fiber-rich foods, low-fat or fat-free dairy products, though I know there's groups that are no, no dairy, 
uh, lean meats, poultry, fish, eggs, beans, nuts, and seeds. So those are some recommendations generally. Of course, there are also people who are looking into the plant-based diets, and we do have a eat clean and green group here that meets in this room the second Monday of uh, every month. So people are looking at, well, what are some plant options that might help? Now, plant foods contain the phytochemicals and protective components, and they modify the central nervous system functioning by providing anti-inflammatory and antioxidant protection. And they call it those brain food. But, you know, we're working with that, lowering the inflammation in the body because there's all the research going on with dementia and cognitive decline has to do with that inflammation. And, you know, the doctor has uh, addressed that as well. So those are what we're looking at with the foods. And um, the phytochemicals and neural protection, um, well, these are the non-nutritive, non-essential plant chemicals that have a variety of protective properties. And you've probably seen those before, the flavonoids the phen phenolic acids, dilbenes, I'm not sure I'm saying this correctly, lignans. So some of these phytochemicals may be hormone, they may mimic the hormones. They're antioxidants, anti-cancer, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, or, and or immune system booster agents. This equals protection from disease. So some of those diets are what they're looking at to help protect all of us from chronic illness and to reduce inflammation in the body. And then, um, so the antioxidant function of phytochemicals play a critical role in protecting cognitive health. So these are some of the things that they do, and their they're antioxidants are looking at the free radicals caused by oxidative stress and are neutralized by antioxidants. And the oxidative stress actually increases with age. Uh, well, antioxidant protection decreases, leading to cellular damage. So we always recommend in all, in all my brain classes a, high, a lot of antioxidants, and that's why uh, the damage can manifest in a decline or motor uh, cognitive function. So a diet rich in these foods uh, can make a difference in physical and brain health. And also the omega-3 fatty acids are important for brain health. All the good fats, we've heard of before. Um, maybe you've heard it before. Anyway, we always stress that so that a brain needs the good fats. And uh, some of these are listed here, the ALA and DHA. You may be taking a supplement with those. The benefits include anti-inflammatory effects, once again, and maintenance of cell membrane the integrity of neural function in reduction of beta amyloid plaque. So that's what they're looking at, because with the you know, dementia, you've got Alzheimer's, the beta amyloid plaque. So the study and research um, is, you know, some of these are things we eat like salmon and olive oil or olives, avocado, coconut oil. Some of these are being researched rather extensively, like coconut, coconut oil. A lot of research going on with that, and you may look that up. Um, and as to what they're looking at in the brain, what's, what's helping. Um, supplements that you may take may be recommended by your physician. You always want to talk to your physician about your supplements you're taking because it may be adverse in some way to medications you're on or something else. So those all look good. I won't get into the organic versus non-organic because that could take a long time, but I know most people are trying to eat more organic or certainly local, um, maybe grow your own. I mean, we have community gardens, but trying to get the food that's fresh and, and that's important. All right, so in generally speaking, when we're dealing with supplements, um, ideal nutrient levels may not be attained in the food and then supplements might be recommended once again, consulting your medical team. The most common supplements used by general population and older adults for cognition and memory are, once again, that spectrum of vitamin C, you know, lots of research on vitamin C for the immune system out there. Vitamin D, which has taken a, you know, front row for making sure we have enough vitamin D, and I know they've related some of that research to cancer. E, which is once again, good for the brain and the B vitamins. When we're under stress, we need more B vitamins. You know, once again, getting it in food or else 
otherwise. Beta carotene, omega-3 fatty acids, ginkgo biloba, though, that's more, you've seen that more recently with helping to, it creates more circulation in the brain. Some people don't tolerate that well, but that's one of those supplements that some people are on. Ginseng, it's a, er, more of a herb. Uh, this one down here that I can't pronounce, <laughs> phosphol of, uh, PS I call it. Anybody on that? People who take that say it really works, that they feel better. But so anything like that, it's always uh, buyer beware. You want to check out uh, what's out there. But good news, spicing it up, and you've probably heard of so much about this now, the turmeric containing curcumin protects the brain by reducing inflammation. How much of that do you take? I don't know. I sprinkle it in water and on food. Some people take it in the capsules. So they haven't determined how much or, but the good news is, is that in, in countries such as India and the Far East where they use the number of these spices, they have very little cognitive problems, They're dementia, very low because their diet is different. Now, I don't know how that relates in cancer, but that is one of the things for cognitive decline. Peppers of all varieties will increase circulation. And then we have this whole host of different herbs out there. The mint helps to eliminate free radicals, ginger, rosemary, and basil, anti-inflammatory. So some of you probably have investigated some of these things and put them into your diet or add them in. So I say research those and find out what works for you. We do have down in Health Links, uh, you know, uh, computers that are available for everyone to look, and there's some good websites. Water, of course, we all need to stay hydrated. That's not that as easy maybe as well, we all have water here today, but just trying to keep up with it all with your food, and then especially when you're in treatment, how much do you tolerate? The average, I'm saying 64 ounces is average, so you're going to see different data on that. There's whole books on how much water you need, so that's going to vary according to who you're reading. Or, But we want to keep that going because when you, you don't have enough water, your, your brain cells don't fire. So food and water, very important, and what we're putting in there, you know, to kind of combat this, the chemo brain. So it, it's sort of sorting it out. It's hard to tell which is what, but I think that, uh, you know, doctors done a good job of talking about these different um, uh, elements that are involved, but these are basics for everyone. Now there is that new alkaline water out there and um, has lower pH to reduce acidity in the body, and some research shows that that's good for your body. I don't say too much about it because, well, there's always going to be somebody who says, well, how good is that for you, really? And you want to do some of that research yourself. You know, it's, after all, it's all about you. There it is, beautiful water. We all need it. So once again, tip, uh, some tips and resources. Buyer beware. I, when I go into a nutrition store, there's going to be a lot of concoctions there for what you can take for a better brain. Well, look and see if it might work for you, you know, keeping in mind what your medical team has said. Check labels, because if you're taking supplements, there's going to be overlaps, and we end up with lots of lots of vitamin D or A, and uh, anyway, it could get, you're taking a lot in. Um, I mentioned about the health links. Um, I also want to bring to your attention the fact that on our torrencememorial.org website, that you can also tune into what the most recent lectures have been. So. We had a doctor who spoke on um, earlier in May, I think I'm gonna say May 17th, maybe I don't have the right date, but you can go onto the website and you can listen to that. So, and then in the Miracle of Living lectures, you can go on and listen to that. So they'll be up for a while and see what you can, if you're not able to make some of these lectures that come up. So it was Thomas O'Brien who spoke Okay, I'm going to say about May 10th. Uh, and he also has a website, thedoctor.com. He spoke on immune, uh, autoimmune illnesses and the blood-brain barrier. That's through the Grazia Dio lecture series, which we were very fortunate to have here at the hospital. We were been bringing in big names, such as Dr. Amen. We have a couple big names coming in 
uh, it, within the next year too. One of them is Dr. Bredesen, the Bredesen Protocol. So some of these are like cutting edge research in uh, brain health, not mainstreamed yet. <laughs> so just letting you know that. You, you might see it on Dr. Oz with a disclaimer, which I actually did see him on Dr. Oz. But there's some new things coming out that's very exciting for all of us in terms of keeping our brains healthy and our bodies healthy. Another one is the Broken Brain documentary series, Dr. Mark Hyman, and he has a lot on nutrition there. Um, we just, both Vicki Hirschberg and I just watched this Awakening from Alzheimer's, which is a series online, you can look it up, several different researchers talking about that. And we hope to be able to show it here sometime, but that's a lot of new information that's out there, and you want to, okay, what's going on out here? Some exciting news, and one of the things they're looking at with all of um, Alzheimer's and dementia is they're looking at it in terms of calling it that inflammation that's going on, uh, type three diabetes. You may have heard some of that out there. So they're looking at that and then starting to look at drug protocols for that. So there's an enormous amount of things that are sort of coming together, I think, at this time. It's very exciting. So I mentioned the eat uh, clean and green. So all of it's hooked together because our, you know, our bodies are so integral and everything affects everything else so it you know keep staying in there with everything and doing the things that you're doing that are working maybe try something new and be positive because i think the future is going to be brighter for us than the, a lot of the research that's coming up okay 